Today we've got a great malicious compliance story all about window washers. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, you need to leave my car alone, if you say so. This is not my story, but my friend Adam's. Adam is a retired police officer and this takes place in the mid 90s, back when Adam was a beat cop maybe a year or two into his service. At the time this story takes place, a fire bug had targeted several businesses over the course of a three month period. The fires were put out, but they were getting bigger and bigger, causing thousands of dollars in damage. Everyone was on edge and the police were patrolling the area every night to try and catch Mr. Firebug. On this particular night in the middle of February, Adam and his partner Rick drew the short stick and thus were assigned to patrol part of the area. While on patrol, he notices a classic Mercedes Benz pulling up to a house and a familiar lady dressed in a thick fur coat steps out. He groans, it's the wife of a local business owner that every officer in this town have had the displeasure to ticket for various parking and traffic violations. It would have been fine if she were a nice lady or something, but no. Her three default sentences were, don't you know who I am, where's your manager slash supervisor, and I'll have your job. Seriously, she was a Karen before Karens were even a thing. Rick points out to Adam that Karen had parked right by a fire hydrant, par for the course. Adam gets ready and steps out of the squad car. Good evening, Mrs. Entitled Ma'am, Adam said. What are you doing here? Karen bellowed. Adam guessed that's the Karen version of the word hello. Working the beat? You do know you park next to a fire hydrant. So, Karen said. I'm suggesting you move it before I write you a ticket. I'm not in the mood for extra paperwork tonight. She said, listen, you need to leave my car alone or I'll have your job. With that, Karen storms off to the house, goes inside and slams the door. Adam thought, if you say so, and proceeded to check the outside of the car for any more violations and wishing that being a bench was a federal offense. As he's putting the ticket under the windshield wiper, the call everyone's been dreading comes on the radio. A fire alarm has been triggered. The address? Right across the street. Adam looks over at the building and can see a faint orange glow in the windows on the second floor. He reports the glow. He and Rick get ready in case Mr. Firebug decides to cross their path. Several officers arrive and set a perimeter around the building as the glow gets brighter and brighter. Unfortunately, by the time the fire department gets there, flashover happens and all the windows on the second floor get blown out. It was so hot that Adam felt sweat form on his face. The fire department need to get the hoses set up, but Karen's car is in the way. Using safety hammers, they break the windows and run the hoses through, getting everything set up in record time. During all of the chaos, Karen comes out and she sounds like a banshee that had swallowed an air raid siren. She runs over and tries unhooking the hose from the hydrant. What are you doing? My car is ruined! It took two officers to restrain her and bark at her to go inside and let everyone do their jobs. She actually listened and returned inside. Adam spent the rest of his shift helping with the fire and investigation. It was close to dawn when he returned to the station to finish up. All he wanted was to go home and crawl into bed. That's when his supervisor calls Rick and him over and reports that Karen reported several thousand dollars worth of damage. Not only had her windows broken, but water had gotten in and froze because it was, again, the middle of February. The supervisor asked them what happened, and they reported everything. Fortunately, the dash cam caught a recording of the event. The supervisor shook her head, laughed, and said, well, you had nothing to do with the car getting damaged, so I consider this closed. A few weeks later, they caught the firebug, a different business owner who was trying to commit insurance fraud. He figured that if several other buildings caught fire, nobody would think he was responsible for burning down his own business. Unfortunately, Karen never did seem to learn her lessons, so she was back to racking up tickets and being a thorn in the police's side. She did have to pay for the damages and the ticket Adam gave her. I was about to say, didn't OP say this took place in the mid-90s and whatnot, but then I realized it's the cop car dash cam, and I realized I've seen plenty of incredible moments caught on camera from the mid-2000s that show these incredibly grainy, blurry police dash cams. It all made sense in the end. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you guys enjoy awesome stories of malicious compliance, why not hit those like and subscribe buttons down below? That said, our next story is debit cards. I work at Wood Forest National Bank. 
For those who don't know, it's a bank based out of Texas, located primarily on the east coast inside of Walmart. This story happened about a month ago. One of our usual entitled Karen customers comes into the bank demanding we print her a new debit card because she lost her old one. We issue debit cards same day so long as they pay a debit card fee, $10 for a reprint or $15 for a new card, waived for certain accounts. A reprint was a simple task, so I print her card and send her on her way. She then walks back into the bank because the last two numbers were slightly rubbed off. This is due to how the machine prints the cards and is pretty common. She says, I want you to print this card again. I say, is it not working? She says, look at the last two numbers. Other banks don't give me cards with rubbed off numbers. I say, I'm sorry ma'am, but sometimes that happens with the machine. It rubs part of the numbers off when activating the chip. She says, I don't care, it looks terrible. Do it again. I said, ma'am, I don't think this is a good idea. We really don't have control over how the machine, entitled Karen, raising her voice said, I don't care what you have to do. Just print my card again so it looks nice. She takes a pair of scissors and cuts up the card into tiny pieces in front of me. Print the freaking card now or do I have to close my account and contact market manager's name? The market manager isn't someone you would know unless you've had a conversation with him before. It's obvious she was trying to name drop him to get me to shut up and comply. Cue malicious compliance. I turn over to my manager and he gives me a nod. I then put on a devious smile and say, absolutely ma'am, but to ensure this won't happen again, we will need to change the numbers, so I'm going to need you to sign some things. She said, see, was that so hard? We then spend the next 10 minutes printing out new cards until we get one that doesn't have the numbers slightly rubbed off. Each time the card isn't to her liking, she cuts it up and says to do it again. I just smile and say, sorry about this, let's try again. Each time until about 8 cards later, she finally gets a card number that isn't rubbed off. She says, finally, this card looks good, thanks. She just leaves with a smug grin thinking she won and leaving us with her massive pile of cut up debit cards. What we forgot to remind her of is a completely new card generated outside of fraud or expiration costs $15 to be deducted from your account. This is made clear at account opening, and since she signed off on having all these new cards printed, there was nothing she could say. Normally I try and help people avoid bank fees, but in this case, freak this entitled woman. A couple days later she comes storming into the bank looking ticked. What the freak did you do to my account? I said, I'm sorry, ma'am, but what seems to be the problem? She says, there's a bunch of debit card fees on my account. What the freak did you do? I said, oh, every time you had me print a new debit card for you the other day, a $15 fee was charged to your account. The first one where you only had me reprint the card number was only $10. She says, you need to freaking reverse these fees right now before I call market manager name and get you fired. At this point, my manager steps in and says, hello, ma'am, what's the issue? Your dumb butt employee tricked me into paying over $100 worth of fees because he kept freaking up my debit card. They said, ma'am, could you please not yell? Also, I was there. You demanded we print you a new debit card because you didn't like the numbers being rubbed off. We have your signature on these forms stating that you wanted these cards to be printed. I will not be reversing these fees for you. She says, then I want to close my account. They say, okay, but first you need to pay off your negative account balance as well as your line of credit. She says, just give me market manager's name's number this instant. They say, sorry, ma'am, but we aren't at liberty to just give out his number like that. Here's the number to customer service if you would like. This is true as he's instructed us not to give his number out to any customer who asks. The only people who need his number already have it. She takes the number, screams, I'll have your jobs for this flips us off, kicks over a chair, and storms out. We get a call from customer care later about the incident where we explain everything and scan over all the signed debit card applications. Also, she had us print 8 brand new cards and the one reprint. That cost her about $130 in fees because she demanded a new debit card. The best part is my manager likely would have just to waive the original $10 fee had she just been nice and asked. Needless to say, I don't think it was too unreasonable of an ask for her to say, hey, could you guys reprint this in a way that it doesn't look damaged or scratched off or well-worn already? But, you know, constructively, like an adult human being. Our next story is The Legend of the Window Washers. This story was told to me by Belle, a friend of mine who is a retired army officer. 
and takes place during the late 90s to early 2000s when she was a second lieutenant. This story is more unintentional malicious compliance than anything else. A fresh batch of second lieutenants had arrived when the story starts. Among this group is a young man who had the misfortune of being nicknamed Dum Dum when he was a cadet, after the lollipop because he liked to eat them. The man was a skilled software engineer and became popular because he was friendly, helpful, and personable. Unfortunately, he wasn't the shrillest whistle on the football field. Not a lot of common sense. One time, he punched himself in the face when told to beat his face, aka do push-ups. When the others realized this, they made sure to make orders clear. Unfortunately, this story is about one of the times when someone forgot to do that. One day, word arrives that a general is coming to the base. Because of this, Colonel Stone, the same one who reamed out a major's wife for threatening Bell's rank, was in a particularly foul mood. Wanting to avoid getting chewed out, Bell volunteers to run several errands. After finishing, she's passing a building when she sees an odd sight. There, standing on another second lieutenant's shoulders, was Dum Dum and he was holding a bucket and sponge. Bell sees that Dum Dum is washing the windows while the other second lieutenant, let's designate him Stepstool, was balancing him, holding onto his ankles. According to Bell, it was like watching a car wreck. You know you should look away, but you just can't. She hears Stone stop next to her, also with a befuddled look on his face. It's at this moment that Stepstool notices that they have an audience and stumbles. This causes Dum Dum to lose his balance and he falls to the ground, causing a bloody nose. Bell and Stone get splashed by soapy water from the bucket. All three second lieutenants stand to attention. What are you two idiots doing? Stone asked. We were ordered to wash the windows on the second floor for the general, sir. Dum Dum said. Why didn't you get a ladder? Stone asked. We weren't ordered to use a ladder, sir. We were just told to get it done. Stone stared for 10 seconds. Stern is his namesake before walking around the building. It's then they hear him laughing hysterically. Everyone is staring at one another, not sure how to react. After a minute, Stone comes back calm as can be. Who gave you the order to wash the windows? First Lieutenant Literal, sir. Go to medical and get that bloody nose checked out. Help them get a ladder, Smith, when they're cleared. And don't do that again, you two. Yes, sir. After getting cleared by medical, Dum Dum was fine. Bell helps them get a ladder and returns to work. By the end of the day, word had spread and Bell got the full story. It turned out that Literal, who was also in a foul mood, had snapped at Dum Dum and Stepstool to go wash the windows on the second floor when they asked him how they could help. When asked how they could reach the second floor, Literal, who really wanted to get them out of his hair, told them, I don't care how, just get it done. And don't bother anyone until you two get it done. He later apologized to Dum Dum and Stepstool. Quietly, of course. Dum Dum and Stepstool finished their chore, and the general's arrival went well. From that day forward, Dum Dum and Stepstool were known as the window washers. Why do I feel like hearing this story, I feel like this was a deleted scene from the time in the army from Forrest Gump. Just a deleted scene that happened with Forrest and Bubba being a little too literal. Our next story is My Son and His Breakfast. My son was about four years old and he gets hungry first thing when he wakes up. He kept getting up and yelling at his mom, demanding breakfast. I had a conversation with him, telling him that he couldn't talk to his mom that way and he couldn't yell at her first thing in the morning to make him breakfast. The next morning he wakes up, comes into the bedroom and says, Hey mom, I'm not gonna yell at you to make me breakfast. Then he went and sat at the table and waited for his breakfast. I couldn't stop laughing all morning. Well, I mean, hey, I mean, that's better than actually yelling, I would say. And considering it's your four-year-old kid, I would say that's pretty cute. Our next story is, check my receipt. I've recently caught on to something my father does. Anytime he goes somewhere, i.e. Walmart, Target with self-checkout, he makes it a point to use it. Then when walking out, as soon as the associate pops off the normal, may I see your receipt? My father always smiles his biggest smile, excitedly chirps a quick, yep, hands them the receipt, and continues his brisk pace past them and out the doors. The bewildered look on their face is the best part. Edit, we're talking food items here guys, and you know, in my 30 plus years in this planet, I've never returned anything to a store, and I'm 99% positive I've never seen my parents return anything either. See, I can't tell if this makes you look incredibly not guilty, or incredibly guilty. 
Like, does this show that you just have nothing to hide? Or does it show that you have everything to hide and you're just trying to get out of there? It's like a more physical version of, look, what's that? And then you just start running. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another awesome malicious compliance story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.